Welcome to another live episode of the Air Crocker Show. I'm your host, former NFL and AFL defensive back. And of course, we're talking to all things San Francisco 49ers, specifically injuries related. We got Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel, Trent Williams, their impact on their injuries and what that means for the 49ers going forward. We're going to discuss all that and more. But first and foremost, I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody that's tuned in, man, I see the flames coming in. Let's go. Let's go. Look at the flames coming in. So everybody's feeling good. Everybody's feeling good today. This is awesome. This is awesome. Gabriel, I see you in here. Let's go. Griffin in here. The caretaker in here. Ricardo in here. Let's go. Everybody feeling good this morning. And I am too. Um, you know, I wake up and yesterday I ran at practice, right? So I coach at Edison and I see somebody in the chat said E House. Let's go. All right. Here we go. Uh, I coach at Edison. And sometimes, you know, you just want to kind of like show the kids you still got it, even if you don't. And I clearly don't still got it, but I do like to, you know, run around sometimes. And I thought I was going to be super sore. I thought I was going to be all messed up from like as many sprints. And I had to run hard too because they were running like this soft coverage. So the softer the coverage, the harder you have to run out to try to like run a deeper route and get by them. So I'm pushing my 36-year-old body a little bit more than it was used to being pushed in the sense of running. And uh, I, I thought I was going to be all messed up. But I feel good. I feel good. feel great. And uh, my ankle's a little tight. I think my Achilles is a little tight. I might have to talk to Coach Desi about that. But aside from that, I'm feeling good. I hope you guys are too. Of course, this show is always brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Use the promo code Crocky and they'll double your initial deposit up to $500, not $100 as you see here. All right. So tomorrow night, you already know it's Thursday night football. We're going to get on Underdog, uh, all that. So make sure that you... Download the app or go to underdogfantasy.com. Use promo code Crocky. All right. But I'm doing a little too much talking. Uh, I think it's time now to bring on Coach Desi. Coach Desi, how you doing? Hey, hey. I'm trying to recover from this L we took on Sunday. But overall, I'm good. It's you, know, you know whose fault I think it is that the 49ers lost? It's Winkler's fault, man. Well, Winkler and, and yours too. All right, and, 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 and this is why. So, Coach Desi, you posted this on Twitter the other day. Oh, and this, yeah. is, this is me and Coach Desi, and this was almost a year ago, right? Like about a year ago to, to this date, like around the same week, right? And because it was only like a few days off, if I'm not – or maybe like a day off. One day off. So, it was one day off because it came up on my memories, and I was like, oh, sweet. So, yeah. one – so exactly a year ago, the 49ers went into Atlanta. That's where I met Coach Desi, and um, everybody had a good time, and, you know, we partied. Shout out to John Chapman. His events are awesome. And the very next day after this picture, the San Francisco 49ers lost to the Atlanta Falcons, a team that I don't think any of us foresaw a loss coming. It was one of those games where it's like, oh, you're good. You're playing the Atlanta Falcons. Everything is good. And – Four hours lost. And then you posted this right before the game. You're like, oh, it was a year ago. I met Croc and, and Chapman, all the guys. And then the 49ers took a loss to the Cleveland Browns. So, you know, a lot of people are blaming the refs. Some people are blaming the, the weather. Some people are blaming the kicker. I'm blaming Coach Desi. <laughs> I'll take it. You know, it's so funny you say that because you know I'm superstitious, right? And yeah. It's really ironic. Probably about – not long after I, I sent that out, maybe an hour, I was like, ooh, we took an L that day. <laughs> so I didn't think it. That was the first thing that popped in my mind when I saw that. that was, the first thing was like, damn, before I lost the game, they shouldn't have lost that day. And then I just kind of left it at that, kind of like went back into the, the memory bank or whatever. But that was- but you bet was, on the game, didn't you? Oh, what? So I was in Reno. And, you know, because obviously California, you can't do sports betting. Reno, Nevada, you can. And I was out in Reno. One of the kids I, I trained for a long time, uh, he plays at uh, UNLV. And they had a game in Reno against uh, University of Nevada. UNLV smashed them. But uh, I put a good amount of money on the 49ers. I put like 100 and something dollars on them to cover the first half spread. And the 49ers did not cover the first half spread, which was six and a half. So I lost some money there. But then I doubled down and was like, okay, well, for the rest of the game, 49ers are going to win, blah, blah, blah. So, I I mean, I put maybe $300 more or something like that, uh, maybe $400 more. And 
they did not. They didn't. They didn't know. Clearly, what I was expecting to happen is not what happened. I just thought, like, like we've seen some other games with the 49ers uh, start slow a little bit against the Giants, and then they pick it up, or start slow against the Rams, and then they pick it up, right? And they end up being the team that you expect them to be and coming away with the W. But that was not the case no. this Sunday against the Cleveland Browns, led by PJ Walker. So, uh, what you know, before we get into the injuries and everything and the tackling stuff. What what were your thoughts just on kind of watching the game and and are you worried there's a lot of overreactions about the kicker about the quarterback Brett Purdy and the 49ers if they're as good as people think but uh, how are you walking away from this game? Um, I, you know initially I was sick as a dog that day too so I was not feeling well fever the whole nine so this was just like the straw that broke the camel's back for me I was like this is it this sucks um, but honestly I think we got to give credit to Cleveland. I mean, they just played a hell of a game and they had two weeks to prepare for us. Um, we had an intense game with Dallas the week before um, who would have thought that Christian McCaffrey and Debo and Trent Williams, you know, I mean, those are three main pillars of our offense, all injured two of them very early in the game. Um, I'm not sure how much film I've not heard anybody talk about this. I'm not sure how much film is out there on PJ Walker for Shanahan to really <laughs> you know, scheme up. I mean, you think, oh, third, third string quarterback, but that's what people thought about Brock too, right? When he finally right. went out there. So, I mean, I think uh, we had opportunities. We had opportunities. It should not have come down to the kick. I know a lot of us have said that. I feel bad for the kid. His entire family was there. I mean, it was, it was uh, not the ideal situation. Windy, muddy, wet, um, it's a gritty game. I love those games generally, but I like them better when we come out with a W. So it is what it is. I'm going to lick my wounds. I think we're going to hit the uh, – going back to the drawing board, I think we're going to be just fine. I'm not terribly worried, but I do have some worry heading into Minnesota that we'll talk about here later. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, Tara Dome says, I called it in preseason. I thought we dropped that one. I think you can – I'll give you that, Tara Dome. If, like, Nick Chubb was playing, if Deshaun Watson was playing – you know, so like once those guys are out, it kind of is a foregone conclusion that the 49ers will be able to lose that game. Like heading into it, I could see how you're like, man, play against Dallas, big win. Even, I mean, shoot, Nick Winkler, what did he say? He said, man, 49ers are going to start 5-0 and and then they're going to lose three straight games. And if there's any time to get the 49ers is why they're kind of banged up with Debo, Samuel, Christian McCaffrey, Trent Williams. Uh, so maybe this is that three-game skid that, skid that – um, uh, Wink Winky was talking about, but Terra Dome, I'll give you that in the sense of okay, you called the loss in the preseason, but when they don't have Watson, like it, when you said that in the preseason, if I was like, all right, Terra Dome, you're saying they're going to lose, but they're not going to have Deshaun Watson, they're not going to have Nick Chubb. Do the point I still lose that game? And you probably say, absolutely not, like they, they don't <laughs> lose that game. So, uh, you know and then they're not, they don't even have their backup quarterback, DTR. Like, it's like, you know, they got to go with PJ Walker, who, again, PJ Walker, we've seen him play some solid football for the Panthers at times. Uh, he started some games for them, but definitely still. I mean, when you talk about the 49ers and kind of a loaded team, even while losing McCaffrey and Debo and, like, you know, having banged up Trent Williams, that is tough. But you still kind of think, like, ah. Like the, the 49ers, like, you know, you got Brock. You still got I. You still got George Kittle. You know, you still got that defense. Defense. And you say, oh, and the defense are going to give you two interceptions. It's like, oh, yeah, you you win that game. And uh, that just it just was not the case. So uh, you know they got to turn the page. Oh, go ahead. You know what I was most upset about? So the end of the game, it's the final drive. I live in Tampa, y'all. Fox. Switched over to the Bucks game in the final drive. I wow. was losing my mind. I was like, "What the hell is happening?" I was so mad. And fortunately, wow. I, I have another way to watch the Niners games, and I had to like quickly get that up and and connect it to the TV. And I was just got it up long enough to see that we were in field goal range, and I was like, "What?" And then I saw it <laughs> skinned yeah, off. Yeah, just right. veered like, off. Damn it! So, veered off to the right. That's what I was that, that was tough. Yeah, that was tough. Very tough. So, so let's get into some of these injuries. All right. Obviously, the 49ers dealt with injuries from this game, and we're going to talk about the importance of them. So I am going to pull up, if I can stop clicking the wrong stuff. Here we go. I'm going to pull up some of these injuries that they, they got. So let, let's start with 
Trent Williams. All right, we're going to talk with Tr talk about Trent Williams and the injury that he sustained. Looked like a lower leg injury. Actually, you uh, know what? Can, can we save him for last? Because okay, I'm sure. Gonna, I'm going to have that lead into something else. Let's go with uh, one of the other two. All right, here we go. Where is it? Where are they at? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Close that out. All right. Let's go with the oblique. Okay. So, yes, Christian McCaffrey's injury. So, he injured an oblique, which is one of your core muscles. Um, very important in, in actually all movement. So, if you see these little angled muscles here where the big circle is, that's your, your oblique muscles. So, they're not in the front of the abdomen. It's kind of in the side. Its uh, responsibility is for lateral movement, so bending to the side or twisting. Um, both of the both uh, sides of the abdomen have obliques, and so both of them will contract to bring you forward flexion. So every kind of trunkal tr movement of the trunk involves your oblique, every mm. single one. Also, any kind of bearing down, breathing. Um, I mean, I'm talking coughing, sneezing, laughing, trying to have a bowel movement. All of these things require this muscle. So it is a very, very important muscle just for day-to-day -day living. But if you look at, um, go ahead and bring up the skeletal views. I gave you a couple skeletal views here. All right, let me see. There's an internal and external oblique. I'm not sure which one is specifically injured. Um, doesn't really matter. But just for show and tell here, we'll go ahead and, and show you some anatomy. <laughs> All right. So do I pull up the internal or external? You can do the internal first. All right. Here we go. And there you go. So uh, – there's the internal oblique. It connects into the lower, lower ribs, kind of the free floating ribs there and connects all the way down to the pelvis in the front. So that's laying kind of the closest to your internal organs there. Um, that's the internal oblique. And then the external oblique will be next. All right. And this is why they're also looking at the ribs because it does connect in with the ribs. You do kind of want to work, want to make sure that the, there's no bony, abnormalities along with it because it connects in. Sometimes you can get something where you're, you're, the contraction of the muscle is so great that it can pull on the bone and cause a little injury there. And there's the external oblique. So that lays on top of the internal obliques. As you can see, it connects into a much more uh, uh, ribs uh, superiorly ab above. Um, so you have greater, greater um, coverage there all the way from the ribs down to the pelvis again. So this is, um, this is an interesting injury. He didn't look terribly in pain. Um, oh, I saw him stretching on the sideline. So he may have just tweaked it. As we know now, it's kind of day to day. We're, I don't know that I've seen the MRI results come through yet. Um, but, you know, you just want to make sure there's not some massive tear in there. But he didn't behave like there was. I mean, this guy's pretty tough, though. So I'm not going to base it all off of his um, how he's acting at the time, yeah. like, cause yeah. <laughs> yes, and, and that was what they said too. They said that, uh, in, this reported yesterday, it's more of a pain tolerant thing for him. So if he can just play through the pain, I'm pretty sure they're going to get that <laughs> portal yeah, shot. You just, you just want to be careful. You know, you don't want to make something bad much worse. Um, you don't want to completely tear it. You don't want to, you know, you could kind of, although it's an odd place for it to happen, Hernias. So what a hernia is, is it's actually where, you know, this, these muscles cover your internal organs and part of your internal organs are your intestines. And so if you get a weakness in a muscle, the, the intestines can kind of push through that muscle and pooch out. And that's called a hernia. Hernias aren't really dangerous unless it gets what's called incarcerated, where they get stuck. They can't push back into the abdominal cavity. It stays sticking out. And then it can kind of get a choke hold on it and create necrosis and the tissue can die. And then it's an emergency. So it's not typical to have a hernia through an oblique, but the obliques do connect into the what's called linea alba, which is part of the um, another part of the rectus abdominis. That's the muscle with the six pack muscle. So there, yeah. it does connect in with that. And so can you shear a little bit of that connective tissue there? Maybe, 
But I, I mean, I'm just, this is like a very small percentage, but again, just the importance here is you don't want to make something bad worse. And for somebody like Christian McCaffrey, who is just such a magician as he goes through these offensive lines and just breaks tackles, he needs that muscle, um, not just for your day-to-day -day breathing and, you know, laughing and talking. You need that for all the twisting and the t contortions that he puts his body through uh, for, for good movement. So be something to kind of keep an eye on, see how they, if they utilize him. I would love personally to see Jordan Mason get more looks. Um, we're going to talk more about maybe why Elijah Mitchell wouldn't be a great choice for this next game. Awesome stuff there. Uh, so when you when you think about him and, and you talked about how they say it's a pain tolerance thing, would they would they say that it's a pain pain tolerance issue if he could make it worse, or would they say you know what this might be something that over time it will heal? Like what if you know what what is the healing time for something like this? And I know you don't know the specifics of it, but let's say it's just a, a strain. Uh, what? How long would it be to where all right, that strain is no longer a strain and you're back to being able to poop without any type of pain? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but it's just it's just, you know, activity limited is what we call that. It really depends on the severity of the strain. I mean, has I mean, for those of us that have been in the gym and did a, went a little too hard with the abs and like the next day you can't even be like completely straight up because your abs are just wrecked. Yeah. Think about that. That's kind of the feeling that he's going to have there. Is that, oh, you know, yeah, you're not going to die because you overworked your abs, but it's not comfortable, right? So, um, you know, I think it'll be really interesting to see how he works through practices this week, see how his movement is. That's really going to give us all the information that we're going to need as to how long this can be. Because this can be, if you've got tears in there, I mean, that can be six weeks. If, if it's minor, it could be, you know, again, just pain limiting. So it could be a week, two weeks three weeks, four weeks, just again, depends on those two things. All right. So we have one more injury to kind of talk about here and uh, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. Can I, there we go. And bring up this Debo Samuel injury. I wasn't even aware of what he was Yeah. So there it is. So he's got the ball on the right arm. And as classic Debo, he's going to try to get as much yardage as possible. So he brings that elbow up and kind of grabs and then rolls right onto the shoulder. Um, I did read somewhere, I think it was today, where it sounded like he had some kind of nerve, maybe a stinger there. He said he couldn't really feel into his arm quite well. Mm. Um, so I think day to day, it might have just been a stinger where you kind of jolt the nerve. And it sends this electrical sensation down the arm. Really, again, same thing. Just you know, got to wait that out. But I, hopefully that's all there is to that. It seems pretty conclusive considering I'm sure they put him through the entire evaluation, checking his rotator cuff and all those things. So that's good news for us. <laughs> so let's say that the three of these guys aren't able. Oh, we didn't, we didn't do Trent Williams. Oh, we got to get through. Yeah, we got to get through Trent. All right, here we go. Here we go. Let me see. And that one, as soon as I saw it, I said, ah, oh, man, that looks like a high ankle sprain. And I, I think I've talked a little bit about me getting a high ankle sprain. You know, I was I was relatively healthy playing really throughout my career. When I say career, I mean, you know, just the time I played football. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I had never missed a game due to injury. I had some things happen in the offseason. I broke my jaw during spring ball heading into my senior year where uh, I was doing punt returns, and my guy DJ caught me right underneath the chin, and um, I lost two teeth that had got split in half. I didn't wear a mouthpiece. Uh, split two teeth, broke my jaw in three places. So, like, that happened. Uh, spring ball, when I was in junior college, at Modesto Junior College, we, we, we didn't have helmets on or any pads or anything like that. And my guy Vince Andrews, Vince, strong, muscled-up little receiver, caught the ball and like swung his elbow and his elbow caught me right here on my orbital bone or whatever. Boom, fractured it. I had a concussion. I was throwing up on the side of the field and I had never had a concussion before. So I've had those two injuries both clearly to like my face and then some smaller things, but never during the season did I have anything that ever made me miss a game at all. Like from Pop Warner all the way up until last year I played, I, I got uh, this guy went and he, went to go cut block me and he kind of caught my ankle and like rolled. And essentially this is what happened. 
And I thought that, I thought when I got up, I was going to see my ankle looking like Trey Lance's did, where it was like just completely off to the side, like yeah. just snapped. I just thought my ankle had snapped. Like it was, it was like this excruciating pain, like the the worst pain I've ever felt. And it was a high ankle sprain. And um, eventually we found out it was a high ankle sprain that was like a little hairline fracture and you have some ligaments that are messed up in it. But it, it hurt a lot. Now, at first they just thought that it was just a regular ankle sprain. So they had me do everything that they would do for a normal ankle sprain, uh, all the re same rehab stuff. And then for the next game, they just taped it up, gave me a shot, and it was like, all right, you know, go play. And all I could do is, like, I could run straight. I could, I could run in a straight line, but any type of lateral movement, oh, man, I mean, it crumbled me. My, my ligaments at times would, like, give out. Then they're, eventually they're like, oh, there's something else going on here with Croc's ankle. So they they got that they finally got the X ray and all that and they realized oh there's a hairline fracture they got the MRI like oh he has a high ankle sprain and then they put me on IR. Uh, I say all that to say it's extremely painful. So I don't know if that's what was going on with Trent Williams or if this is just a normal ankle sprain. But what are your thoughts on his injury? They have come out and said that it is not a high ankle sprain. So that is really good news. Um, looking at the injury, it looked like it was so most ankle injuries, ankle sprains involve the outside part of the ankle, the lateral part of the ankle. Um, this one, as you can see, his foot gets trapped and it gets pushed to the inside. So he actually looks like he's straining the medial collateral ligament, which is the inside part of his, of his um, ankle. I think I've observed Trent walking before and he seems a little flat footed. So it looks like his ankles naturally cave in a little bit that way, which could benefit him and maybe made this not be as severe as it could have been. Um, so I think he squeaked out of this better than what it could have been. And actually better than what it even looked like when the injury first happened. When I, yeah. when I looked at it again, I was like, okay, this doesn't look as bad as we thought it did initially. However, they did, after the game, put him in the boot. Now, what I'm most concerned and why he's the player I'm most concerned about as we head into Minnesota, Minnesota, guys, is turf. I think this is the first turf game we've played this year. And I looked it up. There's only one other place that we have to go to this year that's turf. And not only is Minnesota turf, but as you guys, if you guys have been, you know, watching the show regularly, you guys are aware that I'm keeping track of the season injury the season ending injuries uh, in the NFL so that I can kind of monitor whether they're turf or grass. So far, I have nine injuries that are season ending. Of those nine, only three of them were on grass. Wow. Let's talk about Minnesota. Mike Williams tore his ACL in Minnesota, which is turf. Also notable, just a couple weeks ago, um, Travis Kelsey that was where his ankle injury happened. He was not being tackled. If you saw that, he just went to cut and his, his right ankle twisted. Justin wow. Jefferson, that's also where his hamstring went out. Now, hamstrings, eh, I don't know if I completely blame that on the turf. But again, you can see the injury happen. It's non-contact, but there was kind of a, a change in position. So maybe he just, maybe that was just going to happen. But I am worried about going into Minnesota um, especially with Trent already having an ankle injury, I would be worried about him on a turf. Gosh, now that's scary. And that's something I didn't even think of, right? We just think about can a guy play, you know, his ankle, but thinking about the surface that he'll be playing on in the next game and how that could impact an injury or, or, or make it worse, or maybe if it's not as strong as it ideally would be, and maybe you are, uh, you know, I always think about if you're not playing full speed, you kind of, open yourself up to more injury. So if he can't just be his normal self and is kind of trying to protect it a little bit, that I feel like that's the time where you're going to get rolled up and it's like, are we going to make it worse on Trent? So, uh, you know, turf, we've seen that take out multiple guys with the 49ers. And you go back a couple of years ago when they lost Nick Bosa and then a couple of plays later lost Solomon Thomas, both with ACL tears for the year. Uh, so definitely not something that we want to speak into existence, but the turf definitely doesn't help things for Trent William, who is playing on an angle. Now, the one thing is, and Brian Peacock brought this up. I actually didn't hear this, but he had talked about how Trent Williams said he, he went back in that game because he didn't want more to have to go up against Miles Garrett. <laughs> you know, he's like, you know what, dude, like 
it's not fair. It's not fair to you to to have to go up against a guy like Miles Garrett, who uh, I know you know with the 49ers, we think oh Nick Bosa, best defense player in the in the, in the NFL. But if you ask the offensive tackles, they might tell you uh, Miles Garrett is the one that we hate going up against the most because he's just so big, strong, and fast. So. Yeah. Uh, incredible, and that was a good good call on Trent because uh, I think it would have been a far worse day if Trent didn't go back in for everybody. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it was already bad. I mean, 49ers quarterback Brad Purdy got sacked three times. We got a question here from Gammon. He says, "When you had a high angle spring, was it on turf or grass?" It was on turf, and I never even thought about that part. Yeah, good job, it Gammon. Turf. It's like my foot got like stuck in the ground, then it like got rolled up on, and it was just. Oh, man. My brothers are ready to jump out the stands and, like, beat the dude up. <laughs> and that's also why I'm worried about Elijah Mitchell. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, he's, still, he's been dealing with, like, injury. And it sounds like Kyle Shanahan, if McCaffrey can't go, which when you hear it's a pain tolerance thing, especially in the NFL, you assume that they'll go. All right. But let's say he can't go. Sounds like Kyle will lean more towards Elijah Mitchell being the main back. And it's like, gosh, <laughs> You know, what What does that mean? I'm not sure what it means that Elijah Mitchell is the main back. Does, does he get the – or lead back, excuse me. Does he get, you know, nine carries and Jordan Mason still ends up with 10 or 11 carries, you know? But yeah. uh, that's definitely something to to keep track on there. And heading into this game, if if uh, Trent Williams can't play, Daniil Hunter is probably the one guy that causes the most problems for the 49ers defensive line. Uh, he's not Miles Garrett or anything like that, but he has been, uh, you know, a double-digit sack guy for a while. A guy I was campaigning for the 49ers to trade for uh, prior to the season. Like, man, go get Daniel Hunter if if you can, and uh, put him put him uh, opposite Nick Bosa. I thought that would have been the tremendous pickup. Obviously, they got Randy Gregory. He has played well, but uh, Daniel Hunter going up against our tackles. If there is no Trent Williams or if Trent Williams isn't 100% healthy, that is one thing that could be uh, potentially problematic. Yeah, I agree. Now, Tia, Tia in the chat says, why are we needing to play CMC to beat the Vikings? Let him sit and rest. If this is a Super Bowl bust year, why are you risking CMC? Uh, we need him healthy for the end of the year. I'll, I'll say this, and then I'll get your opinion on it. Uh. I, I just think in the NFL, you you can't overlook any opponent. So I always sound a little bit more worried against, like, the Giants, where I'm just like, look, I, people are like, oh, just just rest Brandon Ayuk. And I'm like, oh, hold on. Like, if Ayuk can't go, then okay. If he can go, I would at least, like, let's see him play. And if the game gets out of hand, then you pull him out. But I always think, like, just in every game, you need your big dog because uh, weird things tend to happen. And I think we saw that. In the, the Cleveland game. Now, the difference in the Cleveland game is you went into that game with a game plan that factored in Debo Samuel and Christian McCaffrey. And midway through that game, you had to kind of scrap a lot of maybe what you planned on doing. So uh, that is a big difference as opposed to heading into the game and not knowing. So if you go into this game and know, I don't have Christian McCaffrey, you can adjust your game plan accordingly to beat the Minnesota Vikings as opposed to not not knowing, you know what I'm saying? And and then it being sprung on you and it's like, all right, we didn't really prepare for these guys. And you got to think about all that they do with Christian McCaffrey. I think he's a big part of the game plan, even if it's on plays that he's not getting the ball. So uh, heading into the game, I do think you can game plan a lot better around Jordan Mason or Elijah Mitchell if you know you're not going to have Stansky. But uh, trying to shot him out there and then potentially lose him Make game because the plan is pretty, but that would be really tough for me. Yeah. First of all, shout out to all the females listening. Thanks, Tia, for that. And I think I saw 49ers girl in here too. So shout out to all my faithful ladies who are yeah. out here watching. But um, I agree. And I think um, maybe even limited snaps would, or would be the option here. I mean, he just brings such awareness for defenses they have to know where he is so it's just valuable for him to be on the field alone and like you said we some of us as fans will say it we underestimated the browns right we knew they had a stellar defense but we overlooked their offense and look where that got us so i think we got to be ready to play every single week and we need all hands on deck whenever possible so um and and that's just kind of unfortunately where we are this is a super super bowl year or bust 
Um, I think that's what we've been saying for the last couple of years. And I think we feel really strong about that. So I don't know that we run them into the ground per se. We've, we've had those conversations, but I liked how the 49ers handled Debo's injuries. I think was it week two or week three when yeah. he had the shoulder and ribs. They had him out there as kind of like a decoy, but really didn't utilize him that much. And I think maybe that's, maybe that's an option. That was the game against the Arizona Cardinals, I believe. And he was out there and he actually did not get one target in that game. So uh, clearly they were being very cautious about his injury and trying to preserve him. Uh, I want to turn the page here. And I saw your tweet this morning on this here. Yes. Uh, and it's, and it says the NFL is considering eliminating the hip drop tackles because they increase the risk of injury by 25 times the rate of a standard tackle per NFL exec Jeff Miller. Uh, and then I see, and here's the rest. When they use this tactic, you can see why they do because it can be a smaller man against a bigger man. And they are trying to get that person down because the object, that's the object of the game. But when they do it, the runner becomes defenseless. They can't kick their, uh, way out from underneath them, and that's the problem. That there's there there that's that's where the injuries occur. Uh, you see the ankle get trapped underneath the weight of the defender. NFL's competition committee chairman Rick McKay said, uh, "Geno Smith had to lead the Giants game week four after taking a hip drop tackle from Isaiah Simmons. Tony Pollard suffered a fractured fibula from a hip drop tackle. And I want to say that was last year in the playoff game, and that's why you see the 49er." Uh, player here. I think that's uh, uh, looks like Jimmy Ward. Jimmy Ward there. So um, as a, a former <laughs> defensive back, I have my thoughts on this. Okay. They I understand what the NFL is trying to do. They, they want to make everything safer uh, for all the players involved. But I really feel like this is one-sided. I really feel like everything is heading towards like the just eliminating any any type of advantage or different things that the defensive guys can do. Uh, almost to the point where they're putting the defensive players at risk with certain things. You know, it's like you can't hit a guy in a certain angle, ang uh, angle. If you are going to hit a big quarterback, you have to, like, hit him right in this one specific spot. If if that target area changes too much, you might be helmet to helmet, they throw a flag on you. If you go low on the quarterback, they throw a flag on you. If a guy is running and he's defenseless and you have to now change the way that you go to hit him, that can be problematic for the defender. And I've seen some guys kind of uh, hurt themselves trying to tackle a certain way. And now we're talking about this hip drop thing. And look, what people don't understand, like, a lot of these players are big, and most of them are bigger than defenders, right? Unless you're talking about the defensive line, like most of these DBs, they're not big guys. So they're trying to change the way they go and hit guys or tackle guys, and it's really putting the defender at a disadvantage. They're already, like even me, I was a bigger cornerback at almost 6'2", around 200 pounds, right? Well, Guys that I was going to tackle usually were bigger than me and outweighed me. And just, we know, like, just science in general, like that that force and velocity or whatever going, you know, into a collision, I'm at a disadvantage here, okay? So let's say even quarterbacks who people think are, and I saw this, who was I watching? Because I saw the quarterback do it two different, was it Justin Fields? Justin Fields. So I'm watching Justin Fields, who's 6'3", 230 pounds, all right? And you watch him go up against a DB, even me being a bigger defensive back, or let's say a smaller guy like Jimmy Ward, who's probably 5'11", 190 pounds. There's a 40-pound gap. And Justin Fields is really fast. So what I saw from Justin Fields a couple weeks ago watching him, he ran full speed and tried to run over a defender. All right? So now the defender, let's say he doesn't know if he's going to have to – if, if is Justin Fields going to slide? Is he going to try to attack? Is he going to try to run me over? I don't know. So I have to try to kind of embrace for this, embrace for this impact. But, man, I got to go all in because I have to throw all 190 pounds of me or all 195 pounds of me at this 230-pound guy that runs a 4-4, which is that velocity, that speed, like that mass. Like that's going to be hard for me to bring down. Yeah. So he runs over a guy. And then the very next play, he runs full speed at a guy and then drops down and slides. And then you see that now the defender who's going all in on this guy who I just saw him try to run over this guy. And now I got to get my mind right to go and try to hit him. 
and then he just drops at the last second. But I've already committed to going to hit him, and then they throw a flag on the defender. And I just think it's it's really BS how they are making it so difficult on these defenders to make tackles. Even think about the 49ers, right? Drake Greenlaw, he's not a big guy. You know, Fred Warner, he's he's one of the bigger linebackers in the league, right, at like 6'4", 235 pounds or whatever he is. But you don't see a lot of guys that are big like even Fred Warner going and tackle some of these bigger guys. So I think that it's just the more that they do, they t- they just show you we don't care about defense. We don't care about the defensive players. We don't care too much about their safety. They even took away how you were able to cut block big guys. So let's say 195-pound, 200-pound Eric Crocker is having to set the edge, and Trent Williams is pulling. We used to be able to cut him. So we don't have to just take on a 350-pound man running full speed head on. We used to be able to kind of just cut him. You kind of drop and chop him, and it creates a pile, and the guy and it sets the edge, and the guy has to cut inside. Well, now they're like, no, you can't do that, defender. So you just have to just take on pulling Trent Williams head on and then get kicked out the club, and then everybody make fun of you. Oh, look how this defender got blown up. You know, it's just right. like everything they're doing, I know I'm going on the right here. It just sucks. It sucks. That you, you can't touch receivers. If you hit a receiver, you can't touch them when the ball's in the air. And, but if you hit a receiver too hard, they throw a flag on you. But then you can't cut like You can't protect yourself. It, it's just – it's it's it too makes much. it hard for me to watch – I mean, I'm going to watch football. But it makes it hard for me to, like, like – not not get upset when I'm watching a game and how much the defensive guys are at a disadvantage. But I would love to hear your thoughts on this. No, 100%. Actually, it was, it was your opinion I wanted to hear more on. This, I can't exp- – I'd like to get my hands on the data. Um, I want to see – because I still think – they say all this, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, let's take away this tackle. But what are you doing about turf? Like, you need to get mm. turf out of there. Like you can't speak out of this side of the mouth and then turn around and speak out of this side. Like if you really care about player safety and the players have come out and said that they do not prefer turf, why are you not listening to your players and honoring that and doing it? Right. And this is just like, I'm only tracking the season injury ending stuff like the turf toe. Like we have turf toe because that's the specific injury you get on Turf, we don't call it grass toe, right? <laughs> I mean, come on, man. So I'm interested to see if this data, okay, was were these injuries on grass? Were they on turf? Was it a mixed bag? Like, what does the what are the other variables besides the tackle? Are we looking right. at? Um, and that's what I think. We're so quick to react to just oh the headline, right? This is the headline. This is what they're saying. But give me the data. Like, I need to to look it up. I need to see how they did this study, how they conducted it, what were the variables, what, you know, how do they extrapolate the data numbers? And so I really can't formulate an opinion on it without looking at it. But my gut reaction was, well, that's stupid. <laughs> like that sucks. <laughs> Just as far as like, again, like you're, you're taking too much away. You're talking about a girl who watched Ronnie Lott and, you know, we watched Reggie, you know, Reggie, but um, Reggie White. Reggie White, thank you. And we watched these like, tremendous defensive players just be able to like bulldoze and hit. And just over the years, it's just gotten to be, like you said, so difficult as a defender, especially when you're not some 250 pound guy bringing down another 250 pound guy, right? You've got to find some kind of way to utilize your assets and what your build is to bring down somebody like a Debo Samuel. That's a big guy. Right. Like, you're not bringing that guy down. If you're, if you're one. I, I like that you said that because, you know, I, I brought up, well, actually we didn't even bring up the Chauncey Garner Johnson and Debo Samuel feud that's going on right now oh, on yeah. social media before those, uh, uh, between those two guys. But let's say Chauncey Garner Johnson, he's not a big guy. Like Debo is bigger than him. So when he goes, to hit Debo when they, if the 49ers and Lions play in the postseason. He, Chauncey Gardner and Johnson will have to throw everything at Debo. He's going to have to throw everything at him. And if he has to change, well, 
Debo can run full speed at me. He can use his helmet as a battering ram against me. But if I do that, then I'm going to get flagged. So I have to change the way I have to go and tackle him. You're damn near about to hurt yourself. That's probably why Chauncey Gardner Johnson is hurt right now, <laughs> you know, because he's not a big guy. And he probably got hurt trying to tackle somebody. You know, like, it, it's just, it's, 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 it sucks. And I understand this part of it. The problem is CTE. And he says, look at Antonio Brown. I hear Antonio Brown talk about, oh, uh, I got CTE. And he's like, you, you don't know. You, how do you know that? Because yeah. can't they, I don't, if I'm not mistaken, they can't detect CTE until they examine your brain once you're dead, right? Correct. Yeah, so. You said what, babe? Yeah, my wife said, yeah. <laughs> like, they, you know, they can't examine until you're dead. So, they, Antonio Brown, he's just been wild, right? And I saw someone say, man, you know, I didn't, I actually thought that Tomlin was overrated until I saw all this stuff that he had to deal with with Antonio Brown that got kind of like they kept under wraps. Like they kept Antonio Brown in check. Antonio Brown's always been this guy. And one thing that I always tell everybody, you know, about, you know, just my time in the NFL, you these these guys are are most of the guys are really cool. Most of the guys are really chill. Uh, but the money doesn't necessarily really change guys. It just makes them more of what they already are. So if you are this like super Christian, good guy, you know, and you give to, uh, you know, different foundations and do community service, you'll probably do those things with or without having money. The, your platform just helps you uh, do it to a, a higher level. Right. And, and the money that you have or resources, which even when I was with the New York Jets, uh, they told us like, hey, if you guys are throwing camps. You doing let 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 us know. We'll help you provide you with this. Yeah, so you have more resources at the at that level. But also, if you're a guy that likes to go to the strip club, and I I got a whole bunch of homies that are broke and they go to the strip club and whatever they got that you know they're gonna throw their last little hundred dollars, right? But also, if you have these guys that make millions, they're gonna go to the strip club. They're gonna do the same thing. They're just gonna throw more money. Yeah, all the money does is just kind of enhance who you are. So the more money that Antonio Brown made, the more it just enhanced the personality of Antonio Brown. And, and that's what we see. I don't think it's CTE. I think it's just an asshole dude that just became more of an asshole the more money he got. I will say there's been studies that show that, you know, the, head, the concussion injuries are more, um, excuse me, hang on a second. Uh oh, we gotta get Coach Daisy some water. There you go. That's a nice mug too. She has. Forever faithful. So Coach Desi's mug says "Forever faithful" on there. You're on mute too, by the way, because you gotta unmute yourself. There we go. All right. Um, there's been studies that show that concussions happen more commonly to offensive players, and so I think that's why they keep. Um, doing things like this to help in, in, in ensure safety of the offensive players is making sure they back off on the defenses. But then at some point you compromise the game because of it. So it I is tough. Know. And listen, as someone who has benefited from a, an injury settlement, I, I understand, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, the, either the insurance company or the NFL, whatever, you're getting hit with these lawsuits and, and these players. And then, you know, I saw somebody mention junior Seau and, We've seen some other guys too. There's an NFL player right now. Um, he just got arrested and uh, in connection to like the murder of his mom, where he was acting kind of wild, right? And he's like, yeah, did he take too many hits to the head? Like, you know, you, you never, you never know. Uh, but I don't know. It's just tough because part of it too is when we when we play football, we know that it's a brutal sport. Like we know that it's an impact sport. We, you know, we know that there are risks that come with it. And everybody that steps on that field understands what could potentially happen. You, you know, take a big hit, uh, get hurt, knocked out. I mean, we've seen guys become paralyzed. Like, you obviously want to prepare the best way that you can, and you hope that and pray that it never happens to you. But when you step on that gridiron, we know anything can happen. So that's the tough part, part too, where, you know, uh, the the way they've kind of gone overboard with protecting 
the offensive players, it just has taken away a lot, in my opinion, of the project of football. I'm always going to watch, but, you know, and I typically, you don't see me complain too much, but there are certain things that about the game that I just hate. College football, I hate the targeting call. It's like if I, if, if this player, let's say this player is running at me, right? He's running at me and it's like, okay, I see him coming at me and I got, I got to hit him. And as he's running at me and as I commit to going to hit him, one of my, one of my players chase him down, maybe trips him up, tackles him. So now this guy's body drops, but I already committed to going to hit him and boom, I make contact with his helmet. They kicked me out the game for that. And it's like, well, what do you want me to do? Yeah. You know, and I say guys are really trying a lot harder to not fall on quarterbacks, not hurt them. And they're still getting flagged. Yeah. I'm just like, you know, that's the part where I think it, it can be frustrating for a lot of people when you see kind of, I don't want to say they're taking it overboard with the safety of these guys, but it's just, it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard sometimes to watch a game that I love, but it's just like, gosh, I understand protecting these guys. Yeah. This is. This yeah. is even – you might as well play flag football. I see people say that, but if if you really want that player's safety, you, you're almost better off playing flag football and and just eliminating pads and helmets altogether. Yeah, and, you know, I think in terms of what they're – they're protecting the player in this – it seems like in this article from lower extremity injuries. And, again, if your goal is to protect people from lower extremity injuries, turf – like, I'm still going to yeah. say it like turf, get rid of the turf. Like let's start there. Then like, then let's reanalyze the data D again, depending on what this data is, you know, been looked at what surface was, was being done on it. But I don't know. It's just, uh, it's heartbreaking. I can see, you know, again, as a fan of over the decades, just watching it go from this kind of game to this game. And I totally agree with all the measures that were done to protect for, from CTE. I totally I mean, that's obvious. You can't, you can't negate that, but I think there's, there's somewhere there's a line and I don't know where that is. And I'm not sure I have all the knowledge to be able to say where that line is, but and, you know, we got to still be able to, to play the game in all of the beauty and, and intensity that it was built. So I agree. All right, here we go. So l last thing we'll discuss today, that's going to John calls out Debo Samuel because he's flash. He's, because he's a <laughs> He's a running back. He can't run routes. Uh, people have asked me about that and just kind of my thoughts on it. And I would say he has he has some points with just the play style of Debo Samuel. Uh, you know, there was a time where I felt like it was kind of hard to argue and keep that stance when it's like, well, this guy went for 1,400 yards, you know. But as you continue to see how the 49ers utilize Debo Samuel, there's really not a whole lot of vertically pushing things that they ask him to do. So essentially a guy who is built like a running back, he's like 5'11", 220, 225. Uh, you know, the way that he's utilized a lot in the screen game, a lot of underneath stuff, slants, things like that. And if you watch just what how he wins, I thought that, and I talked to people about this, early on, like especially like rookie year, you know, coming out of South Carolina, like Debo Samuel was a good route runner. He could run routes. He was quick. He was light on his feet. It almost feels like each year the he gets further and further away from that with how he prepares for the season. So now he's kind of a guy who isn't really honing in on the craft of being a, you know, like let's say Justin Jefferson, right? Like you watch Justin Jefferson, you watch Devontae Adams. Like those are guys that are going to like really work on the little intricacies of being a, legit receiver and super well-rounded. It almost feels like Debo Samuel, like, he's just like, you know what? This is how I win. I'm going to win like this. Matter of fact, he told us this when uh, a couple years ago someone asked him, hey, Debo, uh, you know, are there any receivers that you watch in the league and, you know, take anything from their game? And Debo had a response that I was like, what? <laughs> and Debo said, no, I don't watch those dudes. Like, I don't watch anybody else. I don't take anything from their game. They they can't, they don't play like me, and they don't do the things that I can do. So, no, I don't watch those guys. And I just thought, it, imagine, imagine if you do the things you do that they can't do, and you add the things that they do to your game. Like, how much better of a receiver would you be? 
And he kind of has just dismissed that part. And he's just like, I'm just going to run these slants. I'm going to depend on Kyle Shanahan to kind of get me open. I'm going I'm to win, run after catch. And he's damn good at doing that. But I think it has limited just how great of a receiver he can really be when it comes to just winning, play in, and play out. And I would say that uh, that's part of the reason why a lot of 49er fans, even if they're not thinking about how they're saying this, are saying, well, no, Brandon, I used to wide receiver one. You know, um, and I would also say that that's why I I can't count on Debo to do anything but be productive when the ball's in his hands. But if you told me it's fourth and three and you need this guy to catch this slant, I, out of the 49ers pass catchers, I might have the least uh, uh, confidence that he's going to win his route to make that catch. Now, during the game, you were throwing a slant to him. He catches, he breaks 10 tackles, and that's like, let's go, Debo. Yeah. But I just feel like you don't know exactly if you're going to get that from him. So when Chauncey Garner Johnson says, you're a running back, and, you know, oh, he flashy, he's this and that, and can't run routes. And he's like, I guard you, you can't run routes. I understood, you know, I understood where he was coming from. But uh, obviously, you're kind of poking the bear. And I hope Debo takes that personal, and he's just like, all right. Like, you say I can't do this, you can't, all right. I'm a dog, y'all, and this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to run some routes. I'm going to work on this. And I'm going to hone in on this at practice. But what are some of your thoughts when you hear somebody attack Debo Samuel like that? No, I mean, there's truth to it. I agree 100%. You know what's interesting is I was listening to New Heights, <clears throat> the Kelsey, Jason Kelsey's um, podcast, yeah. and he interviewed Brock Purdy. And this was after the Super Bowl, so sometime this year. He interviewed him, and he asked him who was his favorite person to throw to. Do you know the answer to this? Uh, George Kittle? <laughs> no, it was actually it was actually Debo. And he huh. actually said why it wasn't Kittle was because Kittle, he like kind of catches with his chest. So it kind of can bounce off his chest. Yeah. Interesting. Every time I hear somebody debate now, like, why is Kittle not more in the game? How come he's not, you know, and I'm like, I think about that. I'm like, it does. He, is there a little bit of like hesitation of like if I throw to George it might bounce off the chest you know like so it's interesting that that was said but I don't know according to Brock Purdy he loves throwing to Debo like and I, thought I would say this but... think think about this right think about the 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 division around playoff game against the Seattle Seahawks all right we're just going to use two plays as an example of this obviously this might be the case it might not be the case or whatever but let's just use these two plays as an example uh, Brock Purdy had one of the more amazing plays that we've seen from a 49er quarterback in a long time. Running left, running right, stopping on the dive, miss, making a guy miss, throws the ball in the back of the end zone, perfect throw, corner, on the sideline, and Brandon Ayuk drops it, right? And then let's like look at something that happened a little bit earlier, like earlier either in that quarter or late third quarter or whatever, and Brock Purdy drops back, Throws the ball about eight yards in the air. Debo Samuel catches this out route and just outruns everybody. And it's like, that's 75-yard touchdown. Yep. You know, so I could see how if you just look at it like, man, if I just get the ball in the hands of Debo Samuel, I like throwing to him because he's going to make things happen. And I can count on him like just when I do throw the ball and he is open and he does catch it, something big is going to happen after that. As opposed to Ayuk who dropped the ball, you know, the fade ball or post right. uh, in his game against Cleveland. There might be some inconsistencies where it's like, man, he's so talented. He gets open. He does all these things. But gosh, like when I do get the ball there, I don't trust 100% that he's going to just make the catch. So I don't know if that's the case. I, that's just, I'm just, when you say he likes throwing the ball to Debo more than, you know, anybody else on the Niners, that's the first thing that, well, why would that be the case? And it's like, man, Debo makes you look really good. <laughs> yeah, it does. Oh, man. By the way, did you see that fan for uh, for the Chargers? Yeah, oh, real quick. Coco Puff says, if Green Bay can have grass, there's no excuses for the others. And I think Coco Puff is talking about, you know, just the bad weather, the snow, the, this, that, and the other. So if they can have grass, then there's no reason why the New York teams can't have grass or, you know, some of these other teams that are uh, suffering from injury. And, and and it would have been nice for the Minnesota Vikings, who have this brand-new fire stadium, to uh, maybe do something like Arizona did, which they have that grass that rolls in and rolls out from under the stadium. So that would have been cool. Uh, yeah, but 
new stadium. They're going to do grass in Buffalo's new stadium. Yeah, I saw that as well. Uh, hold on, you just asked me a question. What was it? The fan, the Chargers fan. Yes. So I don't know how you. I have. I, I haven't watched the game with you, Coach Desi. So I got called I don't out. Know how, <laughs> okay, so I don't know how you are doing the games, but if you're excited, but to me, what it looked like. My wife, who's behind me right now, when she's at our kids' game, she's crazier and way louder than me. I kind of just watch. I chill. Am, am I not lying? <laughs> right, you know? Um, I kind of just watch. I'm pretty chill. I just kind of just watch the game, and I don't say a whole lot. She's yelling, screaming the whole time, right? Like, she's just more into watching our kids' games. Seeing that lady, and I saw somebody say, oh, well, she had the Vikings jersey on, and she kind of explained it uh, because there's two different, like, there's her. She's like, man, like, you know, I moved to San Diego, San Diego, or she moved in that area. She became a Chargers fan. Like, she loves it. And she's just a crazy fan like that. And yeah. she was like, you know, people that have seen me at my kids' games, they know, like, that's just me. And she also mentioned how she's always on the Jumbotron at Chargers games, but she just had never been on TV. So she's always kind of been this intense, you know, crazy fan. And they brought up a picture of her being crazy with the Vikings. And she's like, I grew up in Minnesota. You know, I grew up in Minnesota. Like, I have roots to the Vikings. I just changed my fandom, you know. And and, yeah. and it's almost like I would say, you know, one of your kids, right, if, you know, if my son goes to this high school, I'm going to be crazy about him being on this team and excited. But then if he switches high schools, I'm going to be just as crazy about watching them on this team. So uh, there are some people that could change their fandom. She clearly seems to be one of them. But I just looked at it as an intense person on, you know, uh, watching the game. But. People said she was fake and all kind of stuff. No mention of the guy behind him. I mean, <laughs> behind her. Did you see the guy behind her? No, I didn't. <laughs> oh, he was just as into it as her. But yeah. the camera just wasn't on him. So I guess he's not a, a NFL fan plant or whatever they call her. Yeah, I had people on Twitter, like, tagging me and uh, messaging me saying, "Is it, this must be like Coach Desi when she watches the Niners games. And it's 100% accurate. Although she looks to be, like, more of a pleasant fan so it just depends like there's moments that i'm not um i'm not pg let's just put it that way <laughs> yeah <laughs> what was your reaction when when moody missed the field goal well first of all remember i was in the panic of trying to get the damn thing on my on my tv oh yeah switched out but it was just at that point by the time i had because i'm sick trying to get the doggone thing up. And so by the time I got to it, I was just kind of like, I slumped. <laughs> I was just like. Oh, uh, yeah. Because yeah, I didn't I know talking. what happened leading up to that. I didn't know, like, did we have enough time to make an extra play? Was this like, how did this even happen? Like, I had no, no thing. It was just, at that point, I was like, let me just curl up on the couch and go to sleep. <laughs> so uh, me, I was, when he missed the kick, obviously I was in Reno. We were at the casino slash hotel, watching the game. Tons of 49er fans. Well, they had several different TV screens. Up. One was much faster. Like, I would say one was like a whole 25 seconds faster than the rest of them. So everybody that's watching the 25-second faster one, you hear the react. Oh, damn it. Like, how can he miss? And then 25 seconds later, you hear everybody else. Oh, damn it. How can he miss? <laughs> you had to relive it twice. That's painful. Yeah, you had to relive it twice. It was almost like uh, watching something like in the future, like you know exactly what's going to happen, and it was tough. It was tough. But, but fans, um, fans, be easy on the kid, man. Like seriously, that's that's tough, man. He's still young. This is his first miss. Like we got to be a little bit, a little bit easy, a little easy on the kid. Yeah, uh, Chris says people gatekeeping and uh, conspiracy theories are weird. <laughs> It, yeah, like gatekeeping how how what type of fan you have to be to be a real fan. Uh I think that stuff is it's just like man, I've seen all kind of crazy people. We see all these people getting drunk and fighting and beating people. I saw one guy in the charge again. I mean, just getting hammered. I'm like, is he dead? Like, is he unconscious? He, was in so, the hospital. he went to the hospital. Did well, he looked like he was probably gonna go to the hospital. He was laid out and couldn't get up. And I, I really thought, like, is he dead? But um, you know. I guess though, you're not going to question those fans beating everybody up in the stands, but you you question the fandom of a woman who her team is on the one-yard line. She was on the one-yard line. It's fourth and goal from the one. This yeah. is a big game, right before a uh, big play, right before halftime. And 
boom, they score. So they showed her before, like, come on, like, get this, get this yeah. touchdown, like, let's go, come on. Then they scored, and it's like, heck yeah, let's go. Then they showed her a little bit later when she was a little bit more disappointed, which a lot of times I feel like camera men, they do that. Like, they'll find sometimes a fan that is, like, super into it or a kid or whatever, and they might come back to that person knowing that they get a reaction that's worthy of being on TV. So that's what it felt like to me, but, you know, I don't know. I always look at stuff like I don't really care a whole lot about stuff, so. Yeah, just like after the, the Eagles game, there was the kid that was crying in the stands. That always gets my heart. Like, the little boy is just, like, he's crying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll show that fan like when he, you know, when he's excited, and they'll show they'll come back yeah. and show that fan crying. <laughs> exactly. Uh, anyways, I've used up a lot of Coach Desi's time. Uh, Coach Desi, I appreciate you coming on today, and uh, I appreciate everybody in the chat. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button again. Underdog Fantasy promo code Crocky. We'll be getting on that Thursday night before the game, but that's gonna do it for this episode. I'll see y'all Thursday. I have a kind of like a little crossover episode with some uh. Some guys I'm going to stream, the Bengals guys, who I know the 49ers played next week, but we're going to talk to them. All right, but until next time, we're out. Peace.